hi guys, and welcome to the dark side. Can you see what I did there? Um, so I thought I'd talk about uh, bad light or a low light filming. Obviously, winter's now rolled in, and uh, we've got uh, we've got very very little daylight. Well, certainly where I live in, in Cornwall, in England, um, you know we've got not as much daylight. So you know if you want to get out filming after work or something like that, then you really have to start thinking about low light or bad light filming. Uh, I live in Cornwall where there's just, you know, there's very few street lights and things like that. So if you want to be filming out and about in the evenings up right now, um, you're kind of a bit stuffed really in terms of uh, light, unless you happen to have a really bright moon or something like that. Um, so what I thought to talk about is uh, how to get the best results in low light filming. Now for a sort of a comparison's sake, I've got three different cameras, uh, ro well, four different cameras rolling at the moment. Uh, I've got Sony A7S going into an Assassin. Now this is a full frame beast, so that's your kind of like top uh, option. Uh, then I've got a GH5 with a speed booster uh, and a fairly fast prime on there, uh, which isn't going to compete with the A7S in terms of low light, but you know, it's still in its in its category for a small sensor, it's still pretty good. Uh, and then I've also got a another full frame camera, uh, Sony A7R2, but I've got that running in, um, uh, in APS-C mode, in crop mode. So that's basically, that's the three different size sensors, the, your, your main three different size sensors covered there, your APS-C, uh, you know, or Super 35, and then you've got your Micro Four Thirds, and your full frame. And I've also, just for the, just for cracks, just to show you what, you know, the difference is between a crap camera and a, a reasonable camera, uh, there's a GoPro running as well. Um, so as you can tell, I've just sort of like blocked out the light behind me here and got some candles running. There is a bit of natural daylight coming in from that side, which I, I couldn't, you know, I struggled to get rid of. Um, I wanted to get it so it was bad light, but you could still see what was going on. Um, I've got each of these cameras running at ISO 800, at f-stop uh, 2, uh, and at shutter speed 1 50th of a second. Um, so let's go through a few different things, uh, a few different tips and kind of, um, you know, things that I've learned along the way about low light filming and my sort of recommendations. Okay, so let's start off with our camera and our sensor size, just talk about that briefly. Obviously, as I mentioned before, uh, it, basically a larger sensor is going to give you bit better performance than a smaller sensor in bad or low light, or in other words, in high ISO um, performance is going to have less noise the larger the sensor you've got. It's not clear, clear cut completely that way. There are some smaller sensors that perform really well for their class. They might, might start to compete with the next sort of size sensor up. But generally speaking, um, the sensor size is the, is the big, big factor when it comes to high ISO performance. Um, also, you, you know, you've got the actual photo site size, the actual pixel size. So if it's a lower megapixel camera, uh, each individual photo site is a bit bigger. So that kind of like helps it as well, but obviously you've got less resolution there, but let's not get bogged down into detail. Essentially what you want to be thinking about if you want to be filming in low light is what is the size sensor of my camera? Can I get away with this? Um, so the next thing to think about is our, uh, our lens choice. Now, obviously, generally in bad light, you just you want a fast lens. Simple as that. This is kind of obvious stuff, but you know we'll, we'll get into the more detailed stuff later. But basically, you're gonna most likely you're gonna want a prime lens, and you're gonna want a fast lens. Um, the bigger the bigger the aperture, the better. Please remember when you're comparing crop censored uh, lenses uh, and uh, full frame lenses, the f-stop isn't always um, doesn't always equal what the you know an f-stop f2 and f2 on a full frame camera so let, let's say for the sake of argument we've got um, 50 millimeter lens on a full frame camera and we've got a 25 millimeter lens on a micro four thirds camera now both of those uh, field of views match and if you have them both at f2 you think well they're getting the same light it doesn't really work like that basically your f-stop number uh, is is a is a direct result of your focal length and the physical size of the aperture so let's say we have a 50 millimeter f2 and a 25 millimeter f2. Uh, the actual size of the aperture, which is letting in the light on the full frame camera, is twice as big. It's, it's physically twice as big across, which actually means it's four times the area of the Micro Four Thirds um, f2. So even though you've got the same f-stop number and you've got the same field of view, you're actually letting in four times as much light into the full frame camera to fill that larger sensor. 
So please bear that in mind. Obviously, speed boosters change things around a little bit. They're basically, um, think of the speed booster as essentially enlarging the sensor size. It's essentially kind of what it's doing. It's, it's not, but if you think of it that way, then it's a lot easier than worrying about all the, the crop factors and the mass and everything like that. For instance, I've got the XL speed booster on the GH5 at the moment, and that basically is taking the Micro Four Thirds sensor and uh, giving it the same crop as an APS-H sensor, which is somewhere in between uh, APS-C and full frame. So if you think of it like that, then when you put your full frame F2 on a um, Micro Four Thirds with a XL speed booster, um, then that equates to, I'll put the exact number on the screen because I can't remember, but it equates to something around about the sort of F2.8 uh, or F3 um, amount of light because it's still spilling a bit around the sensor. It's not using all of the light coming out of that lens. It's still, miss it's still missing a bit around the edge, but it's still using a lot more than if you put that onto the camera with no uh, speed booster. So that's a factor, but basically in terms of lens lenses, go for primes, you know, whatever focal length you want, it doesn't matter, but just get make them as fast as possible. Obviously, if you have the option of a speed booster, this will dramatically, well, for the XL model, it's a stop and a half of light, nearly a stop and a half light extra. So if you've got the option of a speed booster, do that because your, your bigger lenses gather more light. It's as simple as that. Um, okay, so let's come on to our, our settings now. So. Obviously you want your f-stop, you want the number as low as possible, which means that your, your physical aperture is as large as possible. This is giving you a shallow depth of field, which um, can obviously be problematic in terms of, you know, you can lose focus quite easily. I focused on this guy for this, I'm hopefully roughly in line, but I know it is a fairly shallow depth of field at f2 on full frame and, and some of these other cameras. So you might be losing me a little bit. Um, so you want your f-stop as, as fast as possible, um, as, you want the aperture as large as possible. When I say fast, that means a low number, so a large aperture. Uh, kind of obvious, but you know, some people just still don't know that. Now your shutter speed, now this is quite interesting. So for, for video, which is what we're talking about here, um, you can get away with really lowering your, your shutter speed, um, lengthening your shutter speed uh, longer than you would usually. So if you're, if you're normally shooting at 180 degrees, which I am at the moment with these cameras in 25p, so the frame rate is 25 frames per second, and I've got the shutter speed at 1 50th. Um, now that's that's fine, uh, because this isn't really, re this is low light, but this isn't really, really bad. If I was doing like sort of, a, you know, a landscape in the middle of the night and I was trying to get stars and stuff like that, don't be afraid to bring your shutter right the way down to match your frame rate, as long as your camera will allow you to do this, obviously. Um, if the camera's on a tripod and it's not moving much and you're not filming a subject with lots of movement, do it. Bring, if you go from 1 50th of a second on your shutter to 1 25th, that's doubling the amount of light your camera is getting. So you've got much, much better chance of getting clean images out of your camera. Um, obviously, you know, if you're filming lots of action, you might not want tons of motion blur. So then, you know, change your strategy, bring your ISO up and bring your shutter speed uh, faster again. Um, but yeah, it, my best tip on that is don't be afraid to bring your shutter down to, you know, for cinema type stuff, if it's 24 or 25, don't be afraid to bring it down to like 1 40th, 1 30th, or maybe even 1 25th. Obviously you can't go any slower, otherwise it's under cranking your camera and you're gonna get a slower frame rate. You can't go any slower than your frame rate, obviously. Um, with the exposure, now, it really depends on what you're exposing for. Um, say if you're filming like, uh, you're trying to get stars and landscape, it's proper, proper dark stuff. Don't expect to have your light meter right in the middle, right the way up, because all that's going to be doing is it's introducing a load of noise and it's going to be exposing the scene uh, much brighter than the human eye can see. Which So you're going to have to be bringing that back down again anyway. So you're going to be raising the ISO to get your light meter in the middle. All that dark night sky is going to be getting all noisy and like light blue coloured. Um, so don't be afraid to underexposing camera, but bear in mind that all of your shadows will be lost. So you want to make, you want to be making sure that you're getting it right in camera uh, and you're not basically, um, uh, you know, losing shadow information because the more, the lower you have it, the more to the left you have your exposure, the more of those shadows are unretrievable. Uh, so bear that in mind, but it just depends on what you're exposing for, but don't always expect to have your exposure bang in the middle for a, um, uh, for a nighttime exposure, for nighttime filming, basically. Don't be afraid to underexpose it and get it right in camera because with these modern cameras with fast lenses, like the Sony a7S, that can see way better than I can. Now, maybe you want that kind of like night vision type thing going on and you're fi filming wildlife and you're trying to get a lion in the pitch black or something like that. Then maybe you do want that sort of night vision, but generally people just want it to represent what it looks like in real life, in which case, 
bring your exposure down, get it to match what you can see with your eye. Bear in mind that the screen can confuse you slightly because the screen is quite bright and you're in a dark environment, so it might look brighter than it actually is going to look when you get back to your computer and see it in a room with lights on and stuff. So bear that in mind as well. Um, now in terms of your picture profile, my best recommendation for this is to use a fairly natural uh, picture profile, very standard picture profile, not too contrasty, but I wouldn't say go for log. I wouldn't say go for a very low contrast picture profile um, because all, that, all that's doing is raising those shadows and bringing those highlights down. You know, for some situations, I'm, I'm going back on myself slightly here, but for some situations, if it's like a, you know, a, a, a club or something, there's lots of bright lights and lots of people and lots of movement, you may get away with log, and log may be better because it might be able to cope with those, the massive exposure changes that's, uh, that's happening. But generally, if we're talking about sort of like nighttime, bad light, um, constant light like this, I'd go for something like um, like Cine 2 or Cine 4. I've got both the Sony's in Cine 4 at the moment and I've got the GH5 in natural at the moment. Um, and I wouldn't go for log. I just don't think, you don't need the dynamic range. It's better off just getting a clean image. Um, so keep your ISO a bit lower, keep those shadows down and, and basically get it right in camera. That's what I would say about your pitch profile. Um, white balance, now this obviously varies massively. Generally nighttime stuff is warmer, so you might want to be using tungsten or something like that. Um, but you can really mess this up. So uh, it just depends on every single, like any, any type of filming, it depends on every different type of situation. I've got this in tungsten at the moment. This isn't a tungsten light, but candlelight is very warm. And then I've got the very cold light coming in from a little a window behind the cameras there. Um, so bear that in mind that, yeah, again, you're trying to get it right in camera. So you want to be getting your white balance absolutely bang on right. Um, and, it, you know, just judge it per situation. But often, you know, tungsten, you know, can be the one for sort of like street lights and all that kind of stuff. It will look quite yellow if you're in the UK over here. Um, but that kind of that kind of is what it looks like to the, the human eye anyway. So I'm OK with that. Um, in terms of uh, resolution, uh, I would say go 4K, basically. If you have the option, go 4K because the noise that you're going to be getting is going to be finer in 4K. If you, even if your end product wants to be in HD, um, chances are you're going to get a better HD out of 4K regardless. Um, just because the noise in a 4K image is a bit finer and a bit smaller and not quite so sort of blocky. So I would say go 4K if you can. Obviously, just film in whatever your native... Um, uh, what, whatever your native frequency is, you know, PAL or NTSC. Um, but obviously, the slower your, your frame rate, the more chance you've got of getting a slower shutter speed. So, so if you can get away with going to uh, 24p, um, then perhaps think about doing it because, you know, uh, that will allow you to get your shutter a little bit lower, a little bit longer to let the light come into the camera. Okay, so a couple more, more little tips I'll just say. Um, I'd highly recommend, now with... Uh, noise when not you know noise is your enemy for low light filming um and what i'll say about that is do a test shot if you can so get a shot put it onto a laptop look at it full screen judge your noise noise that way because you really can't judge noise very well looking at an evf or a little flip out screen on one of these you know mirrorless cameras or even on the slightly bigger cameras um, you've still got often a very small little monitor to view. And that's fine for sort of judging most things, judging your exposure and all that kind of thing. But when it comes to judging noise, it really doesn't do a fantastic job. So what I would say is do a little test clip, um, you know, at the location that you're going to be on. If you've got your laptop next to you, perfect, nice big screen to view it on. Failing that, a really good thing is using an external recorder, uh, something like you know one of the Atmos um, Flame or uh, or I'm using the Atmos Assassin on the Sony at the moment, and that thing is brilliant for nighttime filming because you can judge the noise really well. So it's a big HD screen, and you can even punch in it a little bit as well if you want to, and you can see exactly what you're getting. So no nasty surprises when you've been out filming. You get back to the studio and you go, what the fuck is this noisy mess? Because it looked fine or relatively fine through the EVF. So yeah, an external monitor, uh, it's a really, really, really big bonus. Not just because the quality is a bit better um, through an external recorder often, not with every camera, but mo you know majority, uh, but because of the, you've got a bigger screen and you can judge that noise much better. Um, okay, so that's um, that's about all my tips I can think of. So that it's, it's kind of all mostly obvious stuff, but you know the big ones are fast prime lens, um, only raise your, your ISO as much as you absolutely have to. 
bring the shutter speed down this will really help yes you get more motion blur but for most situations for most situations that i film in that's not a big deal if it's me talking right now and not moving much you're not going to notice too much if my hand's slightly blurrier than it is usually um and yeah a standard picture profile i wouldn't shoot in log for low light stuff something like natural or cine 2 or cine 4 that kind of uh, area um and yeah so go out there and have some fun and enjoy filming with uh in these terrible light conditions anyway guys that was a bit of a one take wonder um i hope that was useful uh, i made a few notes here which i kind of ignored but hopefully i got across uh, most of the things that i wanted to get across um also thought it'd be quite fun just to compare these different cameras uh, at these settings obviously this isn't truly truly low light this is just what i would call bad light bad light bordering on low light you know this isn't this isn't moonlit for god's sake but it's still kind of interesting seeing how each one of these cameras handles the same scene uh with a similar sort of lens and all that kind of thing anyway guys peace out i hope that was a bit useful and yeah i shall see you next time